Welcome to your weekly episode of Reset 42. In each episode, we want to carefully sit with the vulnerability and generosity of a guest who has reset their life. Some have just kicked life into gear again. Others are truly survivors. And we'll speak with people who've dug deep to find their passion and reset to a true north. It all begins in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Imagine for a moment that you're facing a pain so horrendous and it just won't go away. It doesn't matter what kind of painkillers you take. It doesn't matter what the doctors say because, quite frankly, the doctors don't know what to do. This is something faced by people around the world now known as CRPS, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. And today, this is a long episode of Reset 42, but it's needed to tell the full story of Mark and Lois Quick and what Mark has been through since um, what appeared to be a minor workplace accident led to a very long journey in the legal system, affecting his career, affecting his family. And some people who are dealing with this say that the actual pain, one, it's rated higher than when a lady gives birth in pregnancy, and two, it's so horrendous that some people would consider having limbs amputated with the hope that it would remove it. However, it's such a complex issue because the doctors don't know how to fix it. Today, we're talking to Mark and Lois to find out more about this incredible story of faith, perseverance, and being able to have grace under pressure. Now here's your host, a man who failed in movie auditions for roles as Lex Luthor, Dr. Evil, Gandhi, and as the rock stunt double, here's Andrew Pitchford. Well, here we are, enjoying a glass of wine with Mark and Lois quick. <laughs> or Beer. shall we say, a pint. Yeah. <laughs> And you guys have quite a few stories to tell, but we're going to focus in on Mark's life and a pivotal part of it, which involved both his career and, I guess, his health in terms of what was actually happening. Yeah. And sometimes it means that you've got to take pause and reevaluate and say, what happens next? But can we start at the very beginning? Because the sound of music tells us that's a very fine place to start. And tell us a little bit about your life in terms of growing up in England. You're from Devon? Yeah, born and bred a Devonian. Um, lived there until I was 18, basically, except for a short period when my parents tried to, decided to try out Australia. Um, but yeah, born and bred there. And what was life like growing up? Were you a single child, part of a family? Um, one younger brother, very normal. Um, Mum worked part-time, dad worked full-time on the tools, and then later out on the office. Um... Yeah, so I would say typically normal. Now, saying normal, but I'm sitting here with a very tall gentleman, <laughs> six foot five, and I do remember one story about when you first went down to have a drink at the pub. You want to tell us how, how that story kind of got away? I might have bit, been a bit younger than the legal age for drinking, but when you're bigger than the, tall, the barman, it's a very easy argument to have. So, yeah. I think that's going to play an interesting part in when we look at what you're facing or what you faced in terms of both your career and some of the, the physical things that were involved there. But tell me about your early dreams. What did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, boy. I suppose very early on, all the standard ones, but early on, I wanted to be a teacher. Um, my parents' advice was not to go into teaching, so I trained as an engineer um, at Hatfield University, as it is now. Um, so I did my electronics degree there. Were you inspired to get into teaching? Was yeah. there somebody that really kind of made an impact on your life? I think, yeah, probably quite a few of the teachers in different ways um, had that influence. Um, I think at secondary school it was history I wanted to teach, and that turned out not to be or never has happened. But, yeah, I, I love learning, I guess, so... Lois, we're looking forward to getting to know your story a little bit later on, but where did you do join into Mark's life? Where did you first connect? So we, <laughs> this is a story. We first connected from, there was, I don't know if you've heard of Billy Graham, he's a very big evangelist. They were doing some satellite um, meetings in Leeds where we lived at the time, and it was being held at a Black Pentecostal church. And from all the churches in Leeds, they'd asked for people to go along and be stewards. 
Um, so Mark and I met there being the only four. He went with his friend, I went with my friend. Only four people wearing jeans. The rest of them were all dressed incredibly smartly and in suits. And we kind of gravitated together. And now, now, be honest. <laughs> We were told off. We were told off for wearing jeans. We were tell, taken aside and told in no uncertain terms we had to that if we turned up in jeans, we wouldn't be allowed inside the church. Okay. So Mark, and as I didn't own jeans, I ended up outside the car, in on car park duty for every day. And I got inside the church, but I used to go out and say hello, feeling sorry for him being left outside in car park duty on his own. So there were two rebels with a cause at this point. Without a cause. <laughs> <laughs> Being rebellious is probably the start of many, but yes, so that's where we first met, yes. Tell me about faith for you, because it obviously has a thread that goes through much of your life. Was it a part of your early teenage years? Where did it kind of come in and intercept? Um, probably no. Um, my parents sent me off to Sunday school, from what I remember, but that wasn't something that um, mm. stuck for any length of time. My grandparents on my mother's side were quite into church and things like that and they would take me along but I normally embarrassed them with my answers to questions so that didn't really help it wasn't really until I was 18 there was a, a time when I went to one of my grandparents churches that I made a commitment but really until I was 18 it didn't mean much to me so what other parts were the fabric of Mark's life I mean you wanted to become a teacher did you have any interest in the arts and sport? Uh, what were the other kind of things that made up your life? Uh, rugby union, a bit of basketball, and reading. I just was a bookworm. A average reader of fiction or non-fiction? Which one is it around? Fiction. <laughs> Got to go in the right way around. No, it was always fiction. It was escapism. So tell me about this teaching career. How very quickly <laughs> did it gain legs? And, and what were the, the subjects or ages that you enjoyed teaching? So when I left college, I did a year as a missionary. Um, so I had my engineering qualification, did a year as mission work. Then um, while I was doing that, I was doing a lot of youth work and I realized I should be teaching. So did you feel like you were, you were on your way? This was a life that you could really invest into? Yeah, it was interesting because I can remember the first teaching practice. It was in a really rough school really really rough you know we had our own police force nicking kids in most lessons um it was really really tough and after the first few days i can remember phoning up my tutor and saying i can't do this and she said mark you're a born teacher you're there for the experience the fact that you're staying in the classroom with those kids shows that you care and you are going to make a good teacher just stick at it I'm really thankful for that because it would have been easy to run away from it. But yeah, I love teaching. As you cast your mind back, can you remember any incidents or a particular student that really made the investment of time and energy in the classroom worthwhile? I think probably unfortunate in the fact that there are too many. Um, up until a few years ago, I was still in contact with kids that I taught, probably coming to Australia broke those contacts, not deliberately, it just sort of happened. I can remember one lad, I finished, it was my first two year course I taught, and some of them were real, a real trial to teach. And I wished them well, and a couple of them had told me what a swine I was, but in more colorful language. And another lad walked up to me and he said, thank you, sir. And I said, for what? He said, because if you weren't that swine, if you hadn't done that, I would never have been able to become a fireman, and now I've got my qualifications to go. So they don't happen every day, but when you get those, it's just like, yeah, I'm making a difference, and this is good. I can imagine there would be days when Mark comes home from work and he's just had enough, and then there's other days where he feels like it was all worthwhile. Oh, Did you see the ups and downs of working and teaching? Oh, definitely. And it depended what school he was in as well. I mean, he worked mm -hmm. in one, two, three, four at least four different schools while we yeah. were together, all very different skills. I mean, the final school he was in was a boarding school and he used to work like 68 hours a week. So it was like single parent almost, you know, being on their own and he'd be completely exhausted by the week, but then you'd have the long holidays which kind of counteracted it, whereas other schools he would come home and depending on the day would be a good day or a bad day. They were just, you know, but he always used to put the extra effort in after school and holidays. 
there's, there isn't such as a short day in teaching. So, so you've got children that have come along around this time. So mm -hmm. how many kids are in the picture at this point in time? When I started teaching, you were pregnant with our youngest? Eldest. Eldest, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't work the other way right around. Right way around. Yeah. Karen. Um, and yeah, all the way through, I think when I stopped teaching, Rebecca was four or five. So you mentioned stopping teaching. There's an incident in your life that's mm -hmm. been fairly pivotal. And it seemed fairly innocuous at the time, not something that many people would take notice of. But do you want to give us a bit of background to actually what happened? You were teaching one day in the classroom or yeah, you were so, doing some preparation? So that school, um, we did Saturday school. It was a boarding school, which is fairly standard. We have, you've got two teenagers running around with two days free. That isn't, you know, one day you can manage, two days is chaos. Um, preparing a lesson on a Saturday morning. Um, writing up some difficult words to spell, so I was checking my spelling carefully, and I had a click, and I turned round to find a two and a half meter long whiteboard falling towards me. I raised my right arm just to protect myself, and it bounced off. Um, at the time, I thought I'd probably broken the arm, but but yeah, I the diagnosis early was just a bruised on the nerve and. It would get better in a few days' time. So I put my arm in a sling and iced it and thanked God that I hadn't broken it. Better than popcorn, this is real, it's life, and it's possibly just what you needed. Make sure you click subscribe wherever you're listening to get our next episode of Reset 42. Now back to the reset with our guest. Now this is 2003. Yep. And I can imagine, one, with your height and everything, but turning around, it's, it's still falling on you. Mm. And it glances off and you think, well, that's a, a great yep. start to the weekend. We'll be getting right later on. Yeah. But that was a start of a very long journey. Mm -hmm. Tell me what started to happen after that. Were there, uh, not improved, but deteriorating symptoms of how you were feeling? I was told that there would be some residue pain. But what happened is almost on a daily basis, the pain seemed to be getting worse. Um, and that felt very, very strange because I could see there was nothing, no injury. And also that the pain was not where I'd hit my arm, which was up around the elbow, but in my hand, my right hand. And... So as well as the pain getting worse, there was a bit about me that, which was thought thinking, questioning my sanity, because that isn't real. It shouldn't work that way. You hurt yourself, pain gets less. And then I started picking up other symptoms, like I would say, oh, to Lois, oh, my hand's really swollen tonight. And she'd say, oh, no, it isn't tonight. Sure looks swollen to me, and she, but it isn't. And you're like, yeah, that isn't very sane, really. So I understand that you've now got a diagnosis of CRPS, yeah. and this is complex regional oh, pain. pain syndrome. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Practicing. Now uh, tell us what it is. <laughs> and, and that's the key. At, at one point, I thought it was compartmentalized. <laughs> so complex it is. It's obviously something that not everybody understands, even the medical fraternity. What was the journey to actually get that diagnosis to understand what you're dealing with? So initially I kept going back to the GP and he kept prescribing stronger and stronger painkillers um, and different painkillers, trying to find the right one. And then after three months... You went for some nerve conduction studies no. and things you did in about the um, January, February time because they thought mm. it was an old, a motor sensory problem yeah um and they came back all normal and then he started talking about this strange thing called rsd which is the old name for crps so i went to see a pain consultant um and this would have been five or six months this after the injury this was the following may so the accident mm. happened in october 2003 so seven months so this was the following may and he said yeah you got crps now, you're experiencing real pain, symptoms like hot and cold hands, mm -hmm. all of these things. But it then leads to the point that you actually end up in a wheelchair. 
How, how much longer did it take before it was so severe that that was the situation? So initially, the CRPS was just in my right hand. Then about two years, just under two years later, just one day I woke up with the pain in my right foot. Um, I just thought, this is just weird. It isn't right. It isn't normal. I'm going mad again. Um, and yeah, it went to my right foot by the end. We were actually on holiday. And by the end of the holiday, I could hardly walk any distance at all. I went into hospital almost immediately and had um, epidurals and things to try and straighten the limb out. But The theory being, if we can get the limb working normally and take the pain away very quickly, it'll right itself. But it never did. But it never did. So no. that happens in about 15, 10-15% of cases. It just spreads. So the control, Lois will know better than me, but basically the area that controls the hand in the brain is quite close to the bit that controls the foot. And sometimes it seems that the CRPS sort of spreads into the neighbouring limb. Um, why it happens in some cases and not others, they don't really know. W would it be fair to describe it as a nervous disorder of some sort? Um, probably a brain injury. It's a, it's a defect in the pain pathway. So the brain, the pain pathway doesn't switch off. So the brain, when you have an accident, your brain does to switch that pathway off because it's got better. Whereas in CRPS, it doesn't switch off. So the brain still says you've got pain, even when there's physically no injury there. So tell me about um, how this was affecting work. Initially, I carried on working um, for a few weeks. Then as the painkillers got stronger, it took me longer to get used to the painkillers. So I started taking it few days off here a week off there as we um got used to the stronger medication because i was working with big machinery yeah you can't go in a bit dozy if you're using a big circular saw that's a way of losing your hand totally um and then when that the pain was just getting worse and worse i was doing for the first few months i just sort of ignored advice to get legal help and in the January it was becoming clear that I wasn't going to get better so I started looking at the legal route and with everything I started taking more and more time off work trying to rest up trying to get it sorted trying a new medication feeling better going back to work lasting Sometimes two weeks, sometimes three days, sometimes maybe a month or more, and then it all collapsing on me again. So you you treat it essentially as a workplace accident, yeah. and you were following that through. But that's where you started to have another battle on your hands. On one side, you're dealing with mm. how this affects just your ability to live, walk, and do things. Yeah. What actually started to happen on the, the legal side of things? Did you have support from the school? No. So in the UK, it's very, very different. So what happened in the end is the school called in an occupational doctor uh, without my knowledge and asked, well, I came in one day and he was waiting for me. We had a meeting with the doctor and the doctor basically said, you're not fit to work. So they laid me off immediately. I'll pension me off as a teacher, uh, which was a shock. I love teaching. I, I was, by then I was head of faculty, Within the state system, I've got the, I can't remember what it, the extra money because I was a good teacher. Yeah, you know, I love what I did. Did you feel that your um, credibility as a teacher was coming under inspection or the microscope, so to speak? Unfortunately, in the UK, there's no such thing as workplace cover. So it is a battle between yourself and the insurance company. Um, the school were encouraged to pass on any negative information that they could find. So at one stage, the school had had a mock inspection. And my so-called inspector hadn't even had the decency to come and speak to me at the end of the inspection. And I'd basically gone to the head and told him I didn't think very much of that. And you'd find documents like that turning up in the evidence. So, yeah, the, 
the school was encouraged to where it could call into question my ability as a teacher, which was ridiculous because they promoted me twice <laughs> in two, two and a half years I've been there. But but the journey did involve more or less being essentially grilled as a witness to your own injury. Yeah. And that would have obviously basically made you feel like you were um, being questioned for your credibility, for yeah. your integrity. Oh, yeah, we had... How um, did you actually stand up under that? Were you, were you concerned about who you are and what the future held? So we even had private investigators following us and taking photos of us and things like that and the so, kids. So the legal case itself took four years in total and this was about six years, six weeks before we were due to court. They presented us with six hours worth of video footage and they'd been videoing us for the previous 18 months. All the different legal appointments that they knew we were going to in the town where we worked, they'd been following where we lived, they'd been following Mark around. They'd done videos of in the kitchen window and in the gardens because it's classified as public viewing, um, so they can get away with that. But that was pretty horrendous. You suddenly think somebody's been watching you, what you've been up to, and all your activities for the previous 18 months. Pretty, pretty hard to swallow that one. How did you process that? Not well, I think, for a lot of it. Um, one of the things I put a lot of stock in was my ability as a teacher and to hear to see the head teacher saying I wasn't a good teacher. Although the logical part of me said, hang on, he promoted me twice. I must be. When you see it in black and white and you're struggling with other things, it's really difficult to switch off and believe what you know you should believe. I was fortunate, I sort of, within the pain team, I had a, a clinical psychologist who worked with me and she was very good. And I sought out some counselling, which helped a bit. And for a period I took antidepressants just to sort of help me come to terms with it because I knew I wasn't in a good place. Was there a time that you can remember where it just felt like it was all too much and you wondered what the road out of this was going to be? Yeah, probably the day I received a letter. We were due to go up to Manchester to see one of their specialists, I think. And I'd received a letter which basically the head had said I was a bad teacher, a bad this, a bad that. And it just destroyed me. I think it was the final straw that broke the camel's back rather than that particular letter. And I went in to see the psychologist and she basically said, I'm so concerned about you, I want to admit you. And the only reason I got out of that was the fact that I was going off to see a specialist and I was going to be with Lois all for the next two days. So she let me off having to go through that. Your children were quite young, Lois, at this time. Mm. And there's a period where four or five years Mark's in a wheelchair. How are they actually processing Dad? They probably see his demeanour change. They're concerned about Dad in the wheelchair. How are they responding to it? They all responded very differently. I mean, Carrie was, I'm trying to think, there must have been about eight, six and four when he actually had the accident. So Rebecca struggled, the youngest. She was four at the time. She very much struggled the most. She's always been particularly protective and she thinks a lot about people. Um, and she was very used to be very protective of Mark. She had a lot of time off school because she was worried about Dad being on his own at home when he was hurting. Um, she used to get very, very defensive. You know, when you go from walking to being in a wheelchair, people respond to you very differently. People look at you different, they treat you different. And until you're in that situation, you don't actually realise. And she used to get very defensive, but she used to get really, really angry. She'd have horrendous meltdowns. Um, so we actually managed to get some child psychology for her. And she's still like it now. She's still incredibly protective of Mark now. Anything that goes wrong, anything that's not right, she'll, she's there with her bat and wicket and she's ready for arguing with anybody. Um, and she saw some bad ones as yeah, well. Yeah, she did. Um, you know, people spitting at you, on you because you're in a wheelchair. Uh, mm -hmm. People screaming abuse at you because you're in a disabled parking bay. And even though you're getting a wheelchair, out, saying, oh, you're a liar, you're this, you're that, the next thing. Because she'd often be with Mark, she'd see a lot of that stuff. Um, you, Kerry's your oldest, and yeah. Josh, mm -hmm. your middle son. Uh, was it difficult for Josh in terms of, as a son, having a dad in a wheelchair? They never said much about it. They were much more pragmatic. I think, you know, we did make the decision early on is to kind of 
incorporate them and tell them what was going on to a certain extent rather than hide stuff from them. I think if you hide stuff from kids, then they worry even more about, well, what else aren't you telling them? So we decided to be fairly, that was kind of the line we took, that we'd be fairly open and honest with them. And I think being that little bit older, they kind of understood it, didn't like it, but understood it. They used to get a bit frustrated when Mark couldn't go into school for parents' things, for some things that were a bit more active. And, you know, the town we lived in was such an old town in the UK. I mean, it's like no drop curves for wheelchairs. It was just difficult getting around. So um, so I think they processed it better. What long-term effects that's had when it affects your childhood, something like that. So at some point in the legal battle, you win your case. Yep. And you find that that brings a bit of closure to yep. one particular chapter. Mm-hmm. But do you still mentally have to shift gears and change direction? I think the first thing we did, I mean, when Mark had stopped working, we downsized from a four-bed house to a three-bed and the girls were sharing. So the first thing we did when that money came through was put the house on the market and went back to a four-bedroom. So in some ways it was a fresh start saying that's the end of that. And that made life a little bit calmer, we had a bit more space and <laughs> the kids were better. So I think it put some closure from a practical point of view that we could then kind of go back to a bit of, you know, the kids have all got their own space and bit more settled that was the and first all, thing we did wasn't yeah, it and i'd always yeah. tried to find work mm-hmm. it was difficult when you're in a wheelchair and they sent me off to a employment agency who was meant to train me the third week i went there they said um right we're going to do this quiz to see what job you're ideal for so i did the quiz and it came out teacher and i was sort of looking at them thinking it doesn't, do you not understand? I was a teacher, but they won't let me teach anymore. They said, I can't. I need something else. It was just like, oh. I think, um, the, thing to, I think the thing to quantify also, it's not just about the fact you're in a wheelchair, because lots of people in wheelchairs work. You, the, the secondary issue, or secondary, primary, whichever way you want to call it, is that the pain is how much you could do when you're working with the level of pain that Mark had, along with the fact because it's a syndrome, you lose dexterity, you lose sensory perception, you lose visual perception of your limb to know where it is. And all those factors also contribute to what you can and what you can't do. So in your heart and mind, are you processing what can I do, what do I want to do? I think the whole process of going through a journey like that is you've got two possible reactions. Uh, And I saw it very early on with CRPS. You either become the condition and your life runs around being a patient. And don't get me wrong, I can understand why people take that journey. Or you say, this is who I am now. There's no point lying about it. This is who I am now. These are my limitations, but what can I do? It's fighting all those battles which society gives you in so many ways. You know, you go on a wheel, you know, you go to a restaurant and the waitress asks, Lois, what I want to eat. Or the people spitting at you, it's just like, you've got to sort of say, that is their problem. I am not going to be that. And that was, it made the court case very difficult in many ways because I was determined to do everything that I physically could. And most people don't have that. No, not most people. Some people don't have that attitude. So, for instance, one of the things they told me to do was do normal activities, but pace them. So rather than just going out and cut your front lawn, do it in four or five stages. Well, one of the videos that the other side had, they'd edited me cutting the grass. So it looked like I cut the grass all in one go. What happened, though, is as you were going along, all of a sudden, my shadow would jump at, at an angle. Or I'd be wearing different shoes or something like that. And it was just like, this is so obviously edited together to look like something which I don't do when I tell you I will cut the grass. But, so I made it harder for my side. You know, if I'd just sort of laid down and let the disease or the condition take me, it would have been a lot easier, but it meant I had other possibilities. One thing that I want to do is I want to come back and find out what living with CRPS is like now. 
because it's very difficult for people to understand what's going on in your body. Mm. Um, often you don't appear to have any pain, but we understand you're dealing with it. I just want to ask Lois, through all of this, your career had to change mm. and adapt. What actually happened for yourself in terms of you know, going from looking after the kids to having to, to work in with Mark's condition? I mean, I'd always worked. I mean, even when I had the kids, I worked part-time. Um, and initially, when we had the kids, I was working as a nurse. I worked evenings in district nursing service. Don't have that here, but I did in the UK. So Mark would come home from work, I'd go out to work and did that for a number of years. Um, and then not long after he'd had his accident, I then went to work in general practice, GP practice. I was just working part-time. I was doing 16 hours a week. Um, and it was kind of around the time that his hours were starting to reduce. And I think at the same time, we decided to put the house on the market because we knew if he lost his job, we'd not be able to afford the mortgage of where we were living. So to reduce that stress, we said, OK, we'll put the house on the market and see what God does with that. Um, sold it actually in three days in the end of November, which in the UK is pretty unheard of. So God looked after it at that point in time. And also at the same time, I had a colleague leave the surgery who worked part time and they let me pick her hours up. So I went straight from working from 16 hours to 24, I think it was at that point in time. And then somebody else left and I picked their hours up. So I actually ended up working 32 hours a week, which actually worked out really well. Um, except that it then meant that I wasn't around for the kids to take them to school and pick them up, which then had a knock-on effect because Mark could do it some days, but not all the time. Um, the advantage was the town that we lived in was quite small. There was one road to school and one road back, and there was only one school, so everybody walked in the same direction and back again, and all the kids went to the same school, so they just went on their own. And they came back and they got used to that, and that's what they kind of did. And With Mark's of condition, adapted. Mark's condition and, and not just mowing the lawns and three sets of different clothes and shoes, mm. did it put more burden on yourself taking care of the family? Oh, definitely at times. I mean, you're looking after him who's not well, he's struggling to come to terms with a complete change of lifestyle and complete, say, loss of dreams and can't do what he wanted to do. Along with looking after three kids that are like, well, hang on, mum was supposed to be at home with us and now dad's at home with us but can't do as much and you're working with this. Um, the plus side eventually was, was that I actually went back to uni and became a nurse practitioner and did my master's degree and was only able to do that because Mark was at home to look after the kids. So I was able to develop my career it was a big juggling act. And, and we also you know, made the decision that there were days when I couldn't, but the kids were never yeah. not. So Lois would often just go out and leave me. Not even a bad, if I was on a bad state, she would just leave. And there the times kids. I did feel a bit like a single parent. You know, it's me going out with the kids again, or, you know, Mark can't come and I'd have to go do this. And we'd go off to the beach and he'd sit there and it'd be me and the kids playing in the sea and he'd be sat on his own. Yeah, you can't put a wheelchair on so <laughs> Don't work. It doesn't work. But, you know, it was very much, you know, and it was balancing that feeling of guilt that I could still do stuff with the kids, feeling guilty because I was leaving him behind. But at the same time saying, we've still got to provide as normal a childhood for the kids as we can. At the same time as balancing Mark's needs and everybody else. So we just kind of got on and did it. You've seen Mark in his, his best and his worst dealing with this pain. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Tell us what it's been like when you've seen him at his worst. I don't know. The worst, I guess, I can remember def definitely coming home from work one day and he was literally curled up on the bed in the fetal position saying, if I was a dog, he'd put me down. He's taken huge amounts of opioids, was still in pain just sobbing and I just thought if he was a dog you'd put him down it just seems unfair to put him through this but at the same time knowing he was such a fighter and he wasn't going to let it beat him that we just had to work through it right now I'm so proud of where he is now if he'd said where he is now compared to where he was even sort of seven eight years ago the amount he's done and how he's fought it do you know when you get married and you say your vows in sickness and in health, it was so good that God gave him the sickness and me the health because I couldn't have coped with it. <laughs> I'm better at looking after. Well, I think I'm better at looking after him <laughs> than I would have been had I had it. You know, he's he doesn't and, let it. And the difficulty is, there's very little that you could do to solve the problem, isn't it? He can't do anything. Yeah. He can't do anything. I mean, he can only pump somebody so full with painkillers, mm. and you know, I never do did. The yeah, he was always very good at doing. He's very much a doctor pleaser. He still is. <laughs> if the doctor says do it, he'll do it. You know, and he's still like that. Reset 42. Tired, broken, blocked, wrong way? 
Whatever the reason, Reset 42 brings real-life stories of people like you and I who have reset to start again. So tell me what um, living with CRPS is like today, Mark. What does it actually involve for you on a daily or weekly basis? Uh, It's hard to explain pain at this level unless you have ever experienced it. To be quantified, if you look at the research and they look at where the pain scales are, you have the McGill pain scale, if you've ever heard of that, it grades different kind of pain. You've got childbirth somewhere near the top, CRPS comes above that, on a const- but it's constant, it's on a permanent basis. So when people say, what's it like going through childbirth, you think, well, we'll have that pain and have it constantly the whole time. And worse. So I understand that you've been through a new procedure to try yeah. and bring some management to it. What does that actually involve? So I've got a battery pack and some electronics in my left hip. No, I keep trying to say my bum. But it's my hip. Um, and that puts small electrical signals. My pain is sort of up here. And most certainly the machine has reduced it. But it's still worse than you can... Most people would ever comprehend it. Yeah. It, I can't explain how bad it is. But it's part of my life. And I've made the decision, by the grace of God, that I'll not let it beat me. A good English stoic determination. I don't think... It, I think it's more than stoic. Um, it's accepting as well. Um, you can't fight this. You can fight the effects. You can't fight the condition. So I can say... Um, me saying I can fight the pain, I can't. I've got to accept that pain is part of my life. All I can do is fight what that means for my life. Now, as part of that acceptance, you've nevertheless had a reasonably major reset. You've moved from England to Australia, re-established the family here. And then as part of that, you've ended up on a journey that's moved away from teaching in the public school type system to becoming a local church pastor. Mm. That's a fairly major change. What brought that about? So one of the things we recognised was, for me, cold was a real problem. So at one stage, I had a thermography where they take a picture of my body. And at that time, my left side, which is the normal side, was two and a half, three degrees warmer than my right-hand side. I don't know how my body did that. That's the cool temperature. So that's not something you have control of, whether you wear a glove or not in your hand. That's your cool temperature. So based on, and we knew from some vacations we'd taken that I was better in the heat. Um, we knew that from English winters. Yeah. You were rubbish in the winter in the UK. It was like cold. So, so in the, it was snowy. So in the winter, I just wouldn't go out or go out for half an hour and that would be it. We had the opportunity. We'd come to the end of, I've been on all the research tri- trials possible in um, the UK and we were looking for other answers. And long story short, Lois turned out to be an Australian, which, which we sort of known, but she had her citizenship. And we decided there was a window of opportunity where the kids leaving school wouldn't be too traumatic. So we said to God, look, if this is something that you're in, you're going to have to open a lot of doors and get a lot of things sorted, but we'll see if you're in that. And, yeah, doors flew open. You know, Lois got a job before we came over here. Um, We found the right church within a week of being here. The people we met at church, one of them was a Liverpool fan and was living just a few hundred metres from where we had rented a house. The house we rented, we were told that we would have to wait um, four or five days to get a yes or a no, and we got a a yes within two hours. Yeah, about two hours. It was just like God just opened doors. Remember to not forgetting that the associate pastor's sister turned out that she also has CRPS, which was pretty miracle considered a rare condition. So again, she was able to point us in right directions for the medical side of things. Yeah. So now you've ended up becoming a local church pastor. Mm. Do you feel that's the fulfilment of a dream? Or do you believe it's a a set of life circumstances that have brought you to this point? 
It's a good question. I think in the back of my mind, it was always probably something in some way that I might have ended up doing. There's a bit of a thing that happens in the UK is if you're a middle-aged man and things go wrong for you, um, there's almost a reaction of God's calling you to the be a pastor. And I really reacted strongly against that. Didn't want anything to do with that journey. Um, looking back, I think I'm a lot better pastor because of the journey you had been than here. I would have been. You had been here three years before you started yeah. your Bible training, so he'd done other work in the period between his getting here. So the first few years that we were here, his pain was much, much better. Um, the wheelchair hasn't been seen, <laughs> except sitting in the garage, not working, since we've been here. Gave um, up the stick. <laughs> gave up the stick. So health-wise, he has been a lot better until the last couple of years. Um, so he had done other jobs up until that, but he got stuck because every job he was applying for that needed a degree, he couldn't get his teaching qualification recognised here because we have no transcript because it's too old in the UK. So I couldn't get a job that needed a degree and any other job that needed a, didn't need a degree, he was overqualified for, which is where the retraining came and working out, well, what are we, what's he going to do? Because he needs to be trained to do something. And that's where Bible college kind of started to... Yeah, I went head to again. the elders and said, I could see two journeys in front of me, whether a pastor or a counsellor. And they basically came back to me and said, it's time to take the pastoral route, Mark. You've been mucking around too long. And yeah, it just opened up and God was good in confirming that. And I think because I know I'm weak, I know I have limitations, and I know the journey that I've been on, it makes me a better pastor and it makes me more reliant on God. And I think that's a prerequisite for a pastor. You know, we don't do this job in our own strength. We can't. So if you were to look at the road ahead, having mm. had all this life experience, have you any ideas or, or tips or guidelines for how you take stock of what you have and reset for the future? My faith, faith helped me. And I don't know how I would have done it without faith. But if I try and imagine it, I think you've got to be really honest. You can't fight what can't be beaten, but you can choose how what's affecting you impacts on you. And sometimes it's e and it's never no, it's never easy. It can be easier, it can be harder, depend on what hits you. For most of us, when little things hit us, we are able to reset and move forward. You know, in our days, things happen and we naturally reset, think about it and move forward. When the big things happen in life, it's a lot easier to say this is just too much, but it's, it's, act, it's actually the same process. It takes longer because the issue is bigger, but it's about stopping listening I would say to God other people would say to yourself or what other people may be I don't know but based on that being able to move forward and seeing that what's happened to you is actually something which can make you better for the future not worse one of the words that really stands out from our talk today has been you saying that you accepted mm. what had happened so it's not about forgetting the past as much yeah. as accepting that it is part of who you are but mm. it doesn't define where you're going. Yeah, it's the same with forgiveness. Um, the Bible teaches us we should forgive. And a lot of people get the impression of, you mean I've got to forgive the person for what they've done to me? And yes, we're called to do that. But that isn't about, it isn't for the person who's done us wrong, it's for ourselves. It really, really is. You can either remain the victim of that person or you forgive it and let it go. It doesn't mean you need to forget. Forgetting is not what we're asked to do. It's saying, don't let what's happened to you, whether it's from a person or, in my case, a whiteboard, dictate who you're going to become. It's about saying, this has happened. 
it's rubbish. I wish it hadn't happened. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But allowing it to become something which is a strength, not a weakness, if that makes any sense at all. Mark and Lois, it's been a privilege to get to know some of the backstory to your life and also the, the privilege of knowing what's made you who you are today. And I think it actually is a, a real picture of how we can learn from our life and then apply it to caring for others. Mm. And I know that's something that you enjoy. So thanks yeah. for spending some time with us. No problem. Thank you. I love the idea that we can reset life without losing all that we've gained. Think you'll come back for more? Make sure you subscribe to Reset 42 on your fave podcast platform. Leave a loving review my mother would smile at you for. Our show notes aren't hidden down the back of the couch. You can find them at www.andrewpitchford.com forward slash Reset 42.